the French Foreign Legion, a unique warrior society, forged from the world's dropouts. Legionnaires have tested themselves against the deserts of North Africa, the jungles of Indochina, and many hell holes in between. Ready to bet their lives in starkly dangerous missions, their only payoff, survival. The Foreign Legion holds a mythical place in the public imagination, in the burning sands of Algeria, in remote mud-brick forts, on grueling marches through scorpion-infested valleys. They fought on year after year against a fierce and determined Arab resistance. In North Africa, the Legion first carved its legend, one of glorious last stands and as a sanctuary for the world's romantic rebels. But how real is the myth? The truth must be somewhere in between. The legionnaire is not as bad as he is betrayed, uh, uh, and his, the core is probably not as romantic uh, as it is often seen. And yet, its romanticism, its image, is really what makes it unique. These are people drawn from all corners of the earth, from all walks of society. In many cases, they're social dropouts. So the legionnaire is a man whom society has rejected. The idea that you can take that person and turn him into a disciplined soldier fighting for France, this is what makes the legion unique in military history. From the very first, the Legion offered a home for the veterans of Europe's battlefields, who in the 1830s drifted to the taverns and back alleys of France. There, they became troublemakers, gamblers, and thieves. There were many uh, old soldiers, ancient soldiers, that, were, uh, be that became civilians that were turning around the street of Paris. People see, sitting in cafe, Doing nothing are always potentially dangerous. On March 9, 1831, France's King Louis Philippe ordered the creation of a new regiment made up exclusively of non-Frenchmen. The purpose was clear, to rid France of foreigners. The Legion was a social dustbin. That was what France wanted it to be. Get these guys out of France. They were causing chaos. France was in the middle of political turmoil ship them to Algeria. What the Legion did with them, they could care less. Get them killed, it didn't matter. Military service in Algiers in the 1830s was extremely hard. The land was hot and arid. Soldiers died in large numbers from disease. And so it was in North Africa that Legionnaires first tested their mettle. When they started the war in Algeria, they were accustomed to uh, war in Europe, and they change totally uh, going to Algeria. French generals in North Africa complained to Paris that the legionnaires were worthless as fighting troops. They lacked discipline. They deserted often. They even sold their equipment to the enemy. The generals wanted the legion disbanded. But France had colonial ambitions in Africa. With the French public fed up with war, a legion of foreign men was a very useful force to have on hand. Though the foreign legion at first tasted defeat, it toughened them. Soon they would earn their reputation for mad bravery at the fortress city of Constantine. Eastern Algeria, is a very bleak place. But there, in the middle of this bleakness, stands this rock, this rock upon which Constantine is built. It is in a bend of the river on three sides. It is sheer cliff walls upon which the walls of the city are built. It is approachable only along one narrow passage. The ruler of Constantine was Ahmed Bey. The French had a score to settle with him. Ahmed Bey had tormented the Legion and the French to death. From this 
fortress in the interior of Algiers, he launched expeditions to attack the French. The French had tried to settle scores with him in 1836. They had sent an expedition toward Constantine. It had utterly failed. They had retreated, and during the retreat, they had been cut to ribbons by the troops of Ackman Bay. They wanted revenge. In October 1837, French generals marched a force of 20,000 troops back to Constantine. It included 1,700 legionnaires. Ahmed Bey had 63 cannon manned by Turkish freelancers. French forces trained their guns on the wall to smash a breach in the defenses. It's like a fortress. You have to crush a wall somewhere to get in. And for that, you need uh, lots of ammunition and guns, and cannon. And then after that, you have to get a uh, highly trained unit to penetrate rapidly, quickly into the fortress. It took two days of constant bombardment. Finally, French gunners smashed a hole through the wall. A messenger was sent in. He urged the Algerians to surrender, but the defiant Arabs sent him back with the following response. If the Christians lack powder, we shall send them some. If they have no more biscuits, we shall share ours with them. But as long as one of us lives, they will not take Constantine. The French launched their attack. When the first wave poured in through the breach, an inner wall still blocked its way. The Arab defenders set off a powerful mine. French fighters were buried amid the ruins. Survivors poured out of the wall, shouting to their comrades to flee. But the Arabs had made a serious mistake. The explosion had blown open the inner wall. Waiting outside and watching the mayhem were a hundred legionnaires led by Lieutenant Achille de Saint-Arnaud. The man determined to risk his neck to save a reputation blackened by debt and dueling. Saint Arnaud hurled his men into the breach. In letters to his brother, Saint Arnaud recounted how he and his men stormed through the narrow streets. What a scene, brother, what carnage. The blood flowed down the steps. Not a cry, not a complaint escaped from the dying men. We killed and died with this hopeless rage that makes you grit your teeth and consigns the cries to the bottom of your soul. This is the first moment when the Legion really performs effectively in battle. This is the moment when they show a glimmer of heroism. Despite the success at Constantine, French generals remained contemptuous of the Legion. One of its harshest critics was Thomas Bougeot, who was named Governor General of Algeria in 1840. He hated Algeria, and he hated the Foreign Legion. If he had had his way, he would have disbanded it altogether. But Paris was not about to do away with the Legion, because every dead legionnaire was a Frenchman's life spared. Forced to keep the Legion regiments, Bougeot trained them mercilessly. Under his iron-willed command, the Legion began to look like a real fighting force. By 1860, the Legion had been transformed. The march-or-die reputation began to be formed. France had come to depend on the Foreign Legion to fight its most thankless battles around the world. And under the Legion banner, they died in great numbers. The most famous of the Legion's slow marches into the arms of death took place at a remote mountain pass in Mexico, at a village called Camarón. The year was 1863. Mexico was in turmoil. France decided to send an army to assert French influence. 
A French convoy set off from the coast, carrying ammunition, arms, and three million francs in gold for French units besieging the town of Puebla. Captain Danjou, who was the administrative officer of the battalion, said, well, I took uh, command of the company and we'll escort the convoy that will bring the money to uh, the, the soldiers besieging uh, Puebla. Captain Jean d'Anjou was a hardened veteran with many scars to show for his bravery, including a wooden hand which he used to lead his men into battle. With a meager detachment of 62 men and two officers, he set out for the hills. They knew this was not a sure, safe mission, and they knew that they, uh, they probably would have to meet a Mexican guerrilla. Sure enough, Mexican rebel leader Colonel Milan and several thousand fighters were waiting in the hills. As Donjou's detachment reached the remote mountain village of Cameroon, Milan attacked. Donjou ordered his men to take up defensive positions in an abandoned farmhouse. Within a matter of hours, over 2,000 Mexican infantry, cavalry, and guerrilla troops surrounded the farmhouse. Donjou realized that the Odds against him were absolutely hopeless. However, he wanted his men to go down fighting. He gathered them all together and he asked them to take an oath that they would not surrender. Then, in a volley of lead from the Mexican guns, Donjou himself was shot in the head. His wooden hand fell from his lifeless arm. Almost all the legionnaires were down. In one corner of the hacienda, which had been set on fire by the Mexicans, there were still five legionnaires who were holding out. Rather than surrender, they fixed bayonets and actually charged out into the Mexicans, who cut them down in a hail of gunfire. When Milan comes up, he finds his soldiers are about to finish off all of the wounded and captured legionnaires. He stops them from doing that, he looks around, he said, is this all that's left? Is this all that's kept all my troops at bay for the whole day? And when told, yes, this is all that's left, he says, these are not men, they are devils. The battle went down in Legion history as its greatest example of brave sacrifice. The wooden hand of Captain Donjou was recovered from the battlefield and is today the Legion's most sacred relic. Cameron becomes the central myth of the Legion heroic death in battle. Here, Cameroon, the heroic death in battle intersects with the anonima, the men without names, to create a unique military legend. In 1882, as he prepared his men for a new campaign in Madagascar, Legion General Francois Oscar de Negrier delivered a chilling message. He told them, vous êtes des soldats pour mourir. C'est pour ça que je vous envoie là où on meurt. Légionnaires, you are soldiers to die, and I am going to send you where one dies. By the turn of the 20th century, the Legion was famous as the fighting force that would throw itself into the most suicidal battles and emerge holding victory, or at least glorious death, by the scruff of the neck. This is what James Jones in his book, The Thin Red Line, called the thin, thin Red Line, is when fighting soldiers cross a line where they don't, they already consider themselves dead. Then they don't have to worry about dying. And I always thought that there was a majority of the people in the French Foreign Legion really didn't care if they saw the sun come up the next day. The legend of the legionnaire as a flawed hero unfolded. He was the deposed prince, the defrocked bishop, the banker caught with his hands in the till. He was a common criminal who redeemed himself in his own blood. And of course, the man wounded in love, who vented his pain on foreign battlefields. And it was a place that these people would go when they had failed elsewhere and find rehabilitation, find redemption in the service of the Legion. Crucial to molding a Legionnaire was the creation of a new identity. As the new recruit entered Legion barracks for the first time, he left his old name at the door. 
once you went over that line, then your past was protected and you could change your name also. And you can change your nationality. So you could uh, say whatever you wish to the outside world, you will be now a legionnaire uh, different than who you really were. The tales of the Legion's exploits were told the world over and inspired young men everywhere to join up. Since I was a child, I heard about the French Foreign Legion. It uh, seemed to me one of the most interesting uh, unit of men existing in the world, and this exerted a great attraction on me. Much of the Legion folklore is about officers whose fearlessness galvanized their soldiers at the deadliest moments in battle. The idea was the officer wasn't supposed to fight. He wasn't there to fight, he was there to lead. And if a man had panache, if he, if he had a certain style, especially in a unit like the Legion, where leadership was not oral, uh, it was not verbal, it was visual. Because the Legionnaires often didn't speak any French. The officer who knew no fear and the fighter who had no past proved to be a deadly alchemy. It would turn the Foreign Legion into one of the most feared bands of fighters in the wars of the next century. At the start of many wars, nationalist fervor and the thirst for adventure can overwhelm the fear of death. World War I was an extreme case. It is August 1914. Paris is chock-a-block with foreigners. War breaks out. There is delirium. France is going to war. The war is going to be short. It's going to be glorious. Every foreigner in Paris, which includes a large number of Americans, large numbers of British, as well as every other nationality, want to get into the action. Men of all ages lined up at recruiting stations, eager to earn medals and come home heroes. Forty-four thousand men from 51 nations joined the Foreign Legion. When these new volunteers joined the Legion, there was a culture clash. These old Lascars from Africa, veterans of colonial wars, covered with tattoos, with wounds, with scars, all of a sudden met the sort of middle-class, idealistic volunteers. These two were destined not to get along. There were fights, there were arguments, there was a gulf of dissension between the two groups. The dislike the old warriors felt for the new volunteers was tempered by the flames of battle. Those who survived earned each other's respect during the dark hours of trench warfare. Every unit had to adapt to the new conditions of trench warfare. What happens in the Legion is that the Legion adapts better than many other units because the Legion is institutionalized, socialized into this idea of personal bravery is important. Don't think about living to fight for another day, attack, and we don't care if we live or die. One of the deadliest battles of World War I was the Battle of the Somme. There, 1,264,105 men died on both sides. It was to this huge body count that American poet and foreign legionnaire Alan Seeger added his name. In the Legion tradition, he had already accepted his own death. In a poem written shortly before his last battle. But I've a rendezvous with death at midnight in some flaming town when spring trips north again this year. And I, to my pledged word, am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous.
Victory in World War I came at an extraordinarily high price, not least for the Legion. Over 31,000 Legionnaires, a catastrophic 70% of their total number, gave their lives. Its ranks decimated, its morale broken, and its traditions in tatters, the French Foreign Legion now lay in ruin. The Legion commander between the two world wars, Paul Rollet, was determined to revitalize his beloved corps. The Legion was not doing well in the interwar years. The old corps had been utterly destroyed in the trenches of the First World War. Different sorts of recruits were coming in, a very young recruit, often very ideologically motivated. You had many Jews coming in, uh, many anti-fascists coming in. That was not the sort of person Rollet wanted. Rollet believed the Legion had become too much like other army regiments, that it was losing its identity. The way to save the Legion, he decided, was to return to its old traditions and its old romance. He reached back. He had to recreate the uniforms. Kepi Blanc had died out in 1907. The epaulets had disappeared. All of that was a revival. The Legion is a revival. It is a revival of a corps which had died. Ironically, it was Hollywood that came to the rescue. Come on. If we don't get out of Ahmed's territory by night, no one will be alive in the body. Films about the Legion popularized the Legion throughout the world, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world. Without Hollywood, the Legion may well have not survived the interwar years. Many was the aimless young man who wandered into a movie theater and became enthralled by the battles amid the sand dunes and dreamed of joining the Foreign Legion. Keep it up, you scum! Keep shooting! Do you like it? They're breaking! Rollet could see clearly how important Hollywood was in rebuilding the Legion myth. And yet, he hated its portrayal of his Legionnaires as cutthroats and scoundrels. The Hollywood films offended Rollet for a variety of reasons. Usually, they showed the Legion officers in a very poor light. <laughs> the Jess brothers, what do they do? They kill their NCO, Sergeant Markov, they burn French property, and they desert. You think Rollet is going to be happy about that? Of course not. On the other hand, the Jess brothers were precisely those people that Rollet would have loved to attract into the Legion, the romantic figure who is on the run from the law, who flees into the Legion to protect the good name of his family. It was not realistic, of course. Uh, everybody knew it was not realistic, but it was founded on uh, on a ground, uh, on a background, uh, which uh, was always the background of the foreign legion. We're in a state of war with some Arab tribes. You men are badly needed here. I don't know if movies uh, attract new soldiers, but they kept the, the spirit uh, of the foreign legion uh, living in the, in the mind of people. They make the foreign legion always living. It took both the determination of General Rollet and the romance of Hollywood to get the legion back on its feet. And it would happen just in time. Now the next great war loomed on the horizon. The social forces that propelled Hitler to the pinnacle of power in Germany seeped like a deadly gas across Europe. As the situation deteriorated in Europe, more and more refugees once again poured into France. Many of them were Jews, communists, Spanish republicans. Once again, what was France going to do with these refugees? The Legion, the traditional solution, put them in the Legion. This caused enormous problems. These were not men without names. 
They wanted to fight for a cause. They wanted to fight Nazism. The old timers disliked them intensely. Many of the NCOs in the Legion in this period were Germans. You can imagine the clashes between these German NCOs and these Jews and these Spanish Republicans. They hated each other's guts. In June 1940, France capitulated to Berlin's demands and under Marshal Philippe Pétain, effectively became an ally of Germany. It drove a wedge in French society and created two nations, the Vichy government that bowed to Hitler Allons, de la patrie, le jour de est arrivé. and the Free French, led by General Charles de Gaulle. On June 18, 1940, General de Gaulle called for continued resistance to the Germans and formed the Free French Army. General de Gaulle appeals to all Frenchmen of the land armies, navy and air force, and all French specialist workmen in England to join him in continuing the fight against the aggressors. The split in France could not but divide the Legion itself. Almost every Legion unit decided to remain loyal to the Vichy government. One unit, however, made a different choice. The 13th Demi Brigade, which found itself in Great Britain during the fall of France. There, they decided to rally to the Free French. The Legion 13th, when he first started out, was his only fighting troops, only. And uh, without, uh, without the Legion, the Free French would be really nothing. They went to Africa, they fought in Eritrea against the Italians, then they moved into Syria. And it was in Syria that you had the fratricidal conflict between the 13th and the 6th Regiment. On June 20th of 1941, outside the Syrian city of Damascus, the 13th came face to face with the unit of the Legion's 6th Regiment, who were allied with the Nazis. It was difficult for the Legion to fight Legionnaire, Legion against Legion. Jack Hazy, a young American serving with the 13th, was among those injured fighting the Legionnaires of the 6th Regiment. I was in front command of the 2nd Company and uh, got a burst of machine gun. Four lots came and ripped across my face and took away a jaw, cut my vocal cords, and that's why I talked this way for the last 50 odd years. I don't think they had really the will to fight us like we had to fight them. Although they outnumbered us by at least three to one. Hyped up, and so we had to win. We knew it, and we would win, and we did. When the fires, the ceasefire uh, came in Syria, the legionnaire of the 6th Regiment was, were asked to join the 13th Brigade to go on the fighting against Germany. Most of them joined the 13th Brigade. So there was only one foreign legion after that. What's the legion about? The legion is about risk. The legion is about fighting and dying. Uh, the legion is about sticking your neck out. There in the 13th, there was a number of people who were willing to do that. They took what I would call the traditional legion response. Go for it. One of the greatest battles the 13th Demi Brigade fought during World War II was at Bir Hakim on the North African front. Bir Hakim was at the southern end of a long line of British defenses, a triangle of bunkers and small hills manned by French forces. Among them, the men of the Legion's 13th Demi Brigade. On May 26, 1942, German General Erwin Rommel feinted a frontal assault on the long British line, then swung his forces in a southward arc to outflank the British positions. But at Bir Hakim, Rommel ran into a brick wall. That brick wall was the 13th Demi Brigade of the Foreign Legion. They stopped cold an Italian armored assault, destroying 32 tanks and taking 91 prisoners. It was a remarkable feat. There were so many abandoned Italian tanks around the position that when 
the Germans and the Italians were coming by, they just assumed that that was an Italian position. So they came right in. And of course, they walked right into the arms of the Legion themselves. Commanding French forces, General Pierre Koenig led hit and run missions with Legion and other French units against the German supply lines, which had become dangerously overextended. Within a few days, the Axis assault seemed to have withered. But then the Italians breached the line to the north, the Axis forces poured through, the Legion was cut off. Rather like at Cameroon, the Legion becomes an island in an Axis sea. The camp was under continual bombardment. The French fended off assault after assault. The Legionnaires held on under a withering fire, even as their supplies were running out. The Germans sent several authors to surrender and never wanted to surrender. And after two weeks of battle like that, they escaped through the night through the minefields and brought back in the British and French uh, line, all their equipment and people. It was the rendezvous d'honneur, a rendezvous with honor. Though ultimately forced into retreat by the Germans, they had stalled the Axis advance. After Bir Hakim, the tide of World War II turned. In 1944, Legionnaires and the Free French fell in behind the victorious General de Gaulle as he marched back into Paris. They had saved the day for France. But now the French Foreign Legion would head straight for a new conflict. It was France's war in Indochina. The fight for Indochina goes on unceasingly in a seesaw battle for the rice bowl of Southeast Asia. There certainly is no accident for the French Foreign Legion to end up in desperate situations, heroic events, uh, because they are being sent precisely to those places where such action and situations can be expected. It was called the Dirty War. Vietnam, then known as Indochina, was still a colony of France. It had become a quagmire where French rulers grasped at the straws of a bygone colonial era. Many in France wanted to retain the colonies, but with public opinion divided, the government dared not draft French boys to fight in Indochina. This was a war for professional soldiers only. A unit of the famous French Foreign Legion goes into training at Algiers. Indochina was a destination that we at the Legion, when we were in North Africa, all dreamed of because we knew there was action. It may be difficult to understand for some people why certain men want action. It was serving the Legion in Indochina that Hungarian-born legionnaire Michel Caponia first killed a man. I did it somewhat reluctantly because I saw him step out from cover and he had no idea that I was there. It was difficult for me to pull the trigger because the man didn't see me. I knew I had to pull the trigger because this is why we were there and we were ambushing these people, we were waiting for them to leave the cover. So this, this is what I will, I will remember and uh, I just regret that this is the way that the situation presented itself. A battle to the death is joined at Dien Bien Phu, an isolated French Union stronghold deep in communist held territory of Indochina. Foreign legionnaires bear the brunt of the attack. The bloody finale to that unwinnable war was the siege at Dien Bien Phu in the spring of 1954. It was a terrible defeat for France. But as at Cameroon, the Legion fought with stubborn courage a battle they knew they would lose. In Dien Bien Phu, the French tried to lure the Vietnamese fighters, the Viet Men, into a trap. But instead, they were themselves trapped. 
The Viet Minh massed in the surrounding hills and began to bombard French positions. French guns hammered back at the hillsides. Then the Viet Minh sent in huge waves of infantry. Surrounded, their airstrip destroyed, the Legion's only means of resupply were parachute drops. Paratroopers and Legionnaires rushed to the aid of their trapped comrades. I do remember that number of uh, Legionnaires who had finished their term re-enlisted just for the privilege with the very clear understanding that they would be parachuted into the Bien Phu. Entire battalions of the French Foreign Legion volunteered to parachute into the Bien Phu. And many people parachuted who never jumped in their lives. It was so dire the need to reinforce people. The Legionnaires fought back hard, but the Viet Minh had more men to throw into battle. The Legionnaires did not. An estimated 4,000 Legionnaires and paratroopers died at Dien Bien Phu. At 5.30 in the afternoon of May 7, the last living Legionnaires surrendered. That was the final straw. One month later, France pulled out of Indochina for good. I had been fighting years and years in Vietnam. I did it because I was ordered to do it, and uh, I did it on my best. As the foreign legionnaire I was commanding, we did our best, but we knew it, we knew it was a, a senseless war. Indochina, Dien Bien Phu, was, for the Legion, a stab in the back. The government had let them down, had not given them the resources, and then sold out Indochina at the peace table in Geneva in June 1954. The Legion was determined that their spiritual homeland, Algeria, would not be abandoned by the French government. They would fight to the last to defend Algeria. Legionnaires rode helicopters into the mountain stronghold of Algerian rebels this summer, hoping to crush the grave challenge to France's crumbling African empire. And indeed, in November 1954, just six months after the debacle at Dien Bien Phu, war broke out between Arab guerrillas and French colonial forces. France hoped for a quick victory. Instead, the war dragged on. The guerrillas resorted to terrorist bombings and assassinations. The Legion struck back with torture and brutal reprisals. The Arab population wanted independence. The French nationals living there were determined their home would always remain a part of France. and dissatisfactions felt in Algiers erupt in Paris. Attached in 1958, de Gaulle had been swept to power, pledging to keep Algeria French. Armed with an overwhelming popular mandate, General de Gaulle flies to Algeria. The French settlers, the so-called Pieds Noir, hailed him as their champion. By 1960, the Algeria question had become a political minefield. As de Gaulle maneuvered ever more cautiously, the Pierre Noir suspected he was going to cut the colony loose. It was a slap in the face. And for the Foreign Legion, it was the final betrayal. I know their sentiments. They must have felt 
that they were abandoned by the French government, that their sacrifices were for naught. On the morning of April 22, 1961, Algiers awoke to the news. Algeria erupts into civil war as four retired French army generals lead the seizure of the city of Algiers and other key points. They have the aid of the units of the French Foreign Legion and the army. Determined not to lose Algeria, one unit of the Foreign Legion joined in the conspiracy to overthrow de Gaulle and the French government. Once again, the Legion was torn by divided loyalties. Phone calls were pouring into Legion headquarters at Sidi Barabez from Legion units all over Algeria. What do we do? The instructions were clear. The Legion is made up of foreigners. Foreigners cannot turn their guns on French people. Therefore, the Legion must remain loyal. Those units who rebelled against de Gaulle were therefore isolated by their own Legion brothers. De Gaulle immediately took to the airwaves and urged a stunned France to come to his aid. French citizens in the army rallied behind him, and the plot failed outright. It was called the victory of the transistors. But then his defense minister, himself a former legionnaire, reminded de Gaulle that it was one legion unit that had been the first to come to his aid in World War II. So once again, the Legion had survived. They are lost in their country, no work, they don't know where to go, what to do. So they join the Foreign Legion because they are sure to find, not a family, but a place where you can live and find other people with which you'll do something. Whenever there was danger, difficulty, controversy, questionable circumstances, they would send the French Foreign Legion. They were unwanted in their own countries and unwanted in France. But they served France well in war after war. They became a tradition. Their orders were march or die. They did both. The survival of the Legion is a remarkable achievement. If you were a betting person, would you have bet on the Legion in 1831? Would you have bet on the Legion in 1841, when Bugeaud wanted to abolish it? Would you have bet on the Legion in 1921, when it had been destroyed in the trenches of the First World War? Would you have bet on the Legion in 1961, when it had rebelled against the French government? That the Legion survived is testimony to the power of its myth. It is the myth which makes the Foreign Legion, which has, counts for its survival. In the end, it was their home. It was their country. Legio Patria Nostra. And their flag was the banner of the French Foreign Legion.